My game of the day from round two of the Tata Steel tournament is Vladimir Kramnik with white against Anish Giri with black. Kramnik drew in the first round, Giri lost. We know that Kramnik always likes to go for it, so this was a real test for Anish Giri. Could he bounce back from that first round of feet? It's an English. Now, Kramnik is a great theoretician. But so is Geary. So what would the former world champion play here? Would he test Geary's opening knowledge? Or would he play a slice serve? He went for the slice serve with d3. So this isn't going to refute Black's system. But we simply have a reverse Sicilian on the board. And Geary took up the challenge. To go for an open game, you could play g6 there, for example, which isn't bad. But we basically just have a reverse Sicilian. Now, g3 would lead into kind of classical uh, dragon variation, but Kramnik went for e4. And, well, this is uh, a reverse Boloslavsky, or any, anyway, uh, well, actually, even a, a Sveshnikov, where this pawn already stands on d3, actually. But then again, if the knight goes back to b6, then that pawn has blocked the bishop from coming to b5. So basically, it's a reversed Boloslavsky. If, uh, if you want to get your naming right. So this has been played before by Caruana, by Carlson, by several other players. Yeah, in this kind of anti-theory um, phase of the game, if you like. Geary fairly quickly exchanged on c3. Now, to some extent, I think this is an anti-positional move. You know, when you're playing the Sicilian with black, you really want your opponents to play like this because it brings the b-pawn closer to the centre. So you have control over d4. Black never has a chance to establish a piece there. So, I don't know... I but it's not that bad, of course, for black, and not at all. Because it means that black wastes no time in developing, for example. So it's very free development for black. And the bishop will stand pretty well on b6. And this has all been played before. In fact, Tarl had this position with white. And his opponent, Chenin, in Sochi 1986, played king h8 but well it burned out to a, in a draw very quickly um queen e7 also being played before not a bad move giri played bishop b6 very solid just withdrawing the bishop and kind of you know preempting any d4 strike but also um if i just put the position back a moment knight e5 and then d4 is also sometimes possible so Obviously, removing the bishop to b6 just eliminates that possibility. Kramnik played a4 here. Um, another very respectable way for white to play would be bishop b2. And, you know, rook in the middle and try to go for d4. It's not bad. But a4, of course, is reasonable because sometimes we might be able to just cause a bit of trouble for that bishop. Queen c2, queen f6 looks reasonable to post the queen actively. And now a Kramnik's plan that he embarked on is really extraordinary. He played king h1. And this is so typical of his direct play. Let's see what happened. h6, okay preventing bishop g5, and now knight g1. An outrageous move, just gunning for f4. Now, given that white has such control in the centre over, over these squares in particular, then it's possible to go for this. But still, it's outrageously direct. And now, well, if black were to play something like g5, it's an ugly move. You could play bishop h5 and maybe swing the knight to g3 to control f5. Or 
you could play it like a king's gambit and open up the position like this. It's also possible. Anyway, Geary played queen d6 after 16 minutes thought. I have no doubt that he was shocked by this ambitious plan from Kratnik. But why not? You know, if we can take here and get in d4, or sometimes even roll forward with, with f5 to set up a, a, a kind of pawn storm on the king side. So Geary took on g1. Now, if king takes, then queen c5 check is annoying, followed by knight d4 and, and black simplifies. So rook g, if white is going to play in this way, you really have to play rook g1. But this entails uh, giving up a pawn. So now this does really look like a king's gambit position, but a king's gambit position that is excellent for white because white has the two bishops, powerful center, mobile center, certainly not blocked in any way, and the potential to attack on the king side. 97 from Geary, swinging the knight round to g6, so he's trying to bolster his king side. It's already extremely dangerous. Bishop a3, and now if the queen swings over here, then it's going to be possible at some moment to open up the king side, and the queen could just stand in the way of those rooks. So Geary well, played the queen back to d8. Now that is it's a real compromise. Black is going backwards here. You can see the development is poor. These pieces aren't contributing to the defense on the king side, and the situation is already critical for black. So knight g6. So this is Geary's plan. At least he's you know managing to hold on to this pawn for the time being. Here Kramnik went forward with pawn to e5. This was a real surprise. We'll we'll come on to what happened in the game in a second, but the move that Geary was afraid of was g3. Understandably. Because if black exchanges, then you can see, well, the files are opening and it's very difficult for black to get a hold on this position at all. I mean, this is so dangerous. Combination with the bishops, rooks, big center. Um, it's an alpha zero type position, but it's a human position too. You know, we'd all love this position. Bishop h3 is more testing. Now, it's possible to sack the exchange, but rook f2 just continues as normal. And, well, if pawn takes pawn, then queen h4 chances to defend, but it's, it's actually not necessary to capture this pawn so quickly. If one builds up first with bishop b2, perhaps looking to roll these pawns down the board, or bishop d3 first, this is highly dangerous for black. Very difficult to quell white's initiative on the king's side. But e5 played by Kramnik. And this gives Geary a chance. Because now these squares are weaker. It's possible for black to get some counterplay on this long diagonal. Now, white is not worse here, <laughs> not by long chalk. Uh, bishop d3 is an interesting move. I mean, it, in some in some respects, a safe move because in this kind of position, well, you can give this pawn up, um, and well, this. This should be absolutely fine for, for, for both colours, actually, because black is going to blockade here. And I don't think there are any difficulties really there for black at all. Um, white is, let me see, no, white isn't even a pawn up. But, I mean, g2 is well protected, probably about equal. But Kramnik is kind of a, a principal player. He wanted to keep control of these light squares. 
and that's why he played bishop f3. But bishop a6 is an excellent counter-attacking move. So if bishop takes rook, bishop takes rook here, one can also simply sack the exchange as well. In any case, Kramnik moved the rook up the board. And now c5, there is no reason to fear bishop takes rook. Black has excellent compensation. This is still playable for white. Perhaps just dropping back this bishop to take on f4. But after this exchange and blockading here, well, I, I really don't think that black is worse in this position. I mean, it's possible perhaps to take this, maybe rook here and activate on the C file. But with the constant pressure on g2, black is certainly not worse in this kind of position. So let's come back. So g3 played by Kramnik. He didn't want to take that, ex that exchange, but perhaps he should have done. And here, Giri missed a good opportunity. He should have just exchanged on d4 straight away and played rook c8. And the point is that, well, the queen can't really come up here because the rook comes down to c3. That's embarrassing. And if queen d2, there's a nice little tactic, and that's to take on e5. Exchange queens and then rook c3. So black will take back one of the bishops with a clear extra pawn. What Geary did was also very dangerous, it has to be said. And now he took, and now rook c8. But somehow in this position, queen d2 is not so bad for white. Um, it's not possible to go in for that variation because in this case the bishop is protected by this rook. And, well, white has compensation here, but black should also be okay because it's very difficult to dislodge this knight because this bishop is going to come onto this diagonal. And, you know, there's a possibility maybe to just sack an exchange again and, well, black's defences are holding firm here, no doubt about that. But queen f5 played by Kramnik, and this is just a bit too crude. Now, if black takes on d4, I should say this did not happen, then there is this very attractive double discovered checkmate. But of course, Giri was alert to that. He played bishop c4, and that's where the the bishop belongs anyway. Of course, it's covering the f7 square, but now it takes control over the critical d5 square. And we can see how e5 has really compromised white's position. Bishop d6 played. So Kramnik still trying to keep control over this. Bishop e6, that's a solid square. And knight f4 keeping some control over d5, um, but this knight controls some really important squares as well. Um, for example, g2 prevents the rook swinging over to g2. And if queen g1, then knight h3 is a winning move, just picking up in exchange. So forking queen and rook, and it doesn't matter about rook g7, the king would just step to the side. So Kramnik played d5. So this is just a bit of distraction, really. You know, he's trying to uh, get through on, on the king's side. So he's dragged the knight away. So now he's actually got in queen g1 and this attack here. But excellent defense from Giri, who'd appreciated that he can just sidestep here with king h8. Now, it's possible to take on g7. But actually, it's impossible for white to follow up here. And in fact, it's black that is going on the attack now. This queen 
covers some very useful squares in combination with the bishop. It can't be um, driven away from there. The knight is looking good. This rook can counterattack at some point down the C file. Um, here, in fact, you know, black is fine. That bishop is loose as well. And yeah, in fact, black is safe in this position. Remember, this rook is going to come down to one of these squares at some point and either simplify or with some kind of calamity on the first rank. In the game, rook d2 played and the knight switched back to f4, but now it's two pawns and, well, Kramnik is still trying to find some, some massive punch through in the position, but it's not happening now. Rook c4, good move, starting to simplify and you can see that, yes, Kramnik has kept control over some light squares here. Um, but, you know, he needs two light square bishops. One to eliminate that knight, but another to cover the squares on this diagonal. You can see if bishop takes, then there's going to be an almighty thumping check on d5, which will just win the game. Queen d4 played. And the bishop came back. So you can see Giri is just playing like a rock here. And Kramnik is hammering away. But against this solid defense, he's getting nowhere. Knight e7, excellent move. So if bishop takes knight, then of course there's a pin. Queen takes queen. And if bishop takes rook, there's knight f5 hitting the queen. Then you take the rook with check and take this bishop so that's that's not working and so Kramnik just came back with a bishop and no it's I'm afraid it's a forlorn hope now knight f5 forces finally the trade of that important light square bishop bishop just nudge back again to e6 if you protect your pieces if they're on solid squares then not a lot can go on sound move and now it's just a case of mobilizing the pieces rook c8 and once that rook comes into the game it really is all over for white and this was the final move of the game queen d8 here kramnik resigned well there are going to be threats on the second rank at some moment and if rook g2 then rook c4 hits the queen. And bishop d5. If you can see something is going to land here or here. And white's king will have absolutely no defense. So a crushing victory in the end for Geary. But, well, we've seen Kramnik play like this over the past few years. You know, he comes in and he wants to land a big punch. And if it doesn't work, then his position collapses. Uh, but it could have done. Giri got lucky. Um, G3, coming right back to this moment, G3 would have really tested Giri's defense and looks very strong for White. So Anish Giri bounces back in round two after his defeat in round one. And he's back in the tournament.